You're listening to Tone Benders, the Sound Designers Podcast. Let's do this. Hey, everybody, welcome to Tone Benders. My name is Tim Muirhead, and I'll be your host today. Joining me in the co pilot seat is Teresa Morrow. Teresa, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Tim. Today, we're going to talk about the new Guillermo del Toro film, Nightmare Alley. Uh, This is a period noir film set in the 40s and uh, follows our main character, Stanton Carlyle. As he joins the carnival, he learns the ways of the grift. Then he goes on to attempt to make his way in high society. Yeah, I'm super excited to talk to our guests today, so let me introduce them to you. We have the film's co-supervising sound editors, Nathan Robitaille and Jill Purdy. In addition to a boatload of past Golden Reel Award nominations, most of you will have heard their work on the film The Shape of Water, which was nominated for Best Sound in the Editing category. Uh, Welcome to the show, Nathan and Jill. How are you today? Great. How are you? I'm doing very well. Uh, Jill, do you want to take us through uh, how co-supervising sound editor worked? How did you two differentiate your roles on this? So Nathan, sound design king, and uh, I took on the dialogue ADR supervision. So, um, yeah, and we work we work pretty well that way. Is this your first time working with those delineated roles like that? Because on the previous film, The Shape of Water, Jill, you didn't have the co-supervising sound editor. I did not. I was I was strictly cutting. Well, no, I wasn't strictly cutting production. I was doing a bit of, of production and ADR uh, work as well. But I wasn't involved in anything on stage for that one. I was in the kind of behind the scenes. But this is not the first time that Nathan and I have worked in this capacity. Um, we've worked to together on on a few things oh yeah we go way back i started in this uh in this industry under the wing of jill and nelson and and a few others so i've basically been working with jill for my entire career and we'll mention that you guys are based in toronto production was based in toronto and we're in toronto so it's like one of these unusual occasions where we're not trying to span intercontinental time zones to do one of these podcast talks so that's great <laughs> it's, also, it's also exciting for us to talk to people in toronto because we actually haven't done a lot of podcast uh, episodes specifically with toronto crews so we're really uh, happy and privileged to have you guys here Definitely. Nathan, you've got a lot of pressure here because the last time Jill was on, <laughs> she was on our dialogue editing roundtable, and it is quite literally our most popular episode we've ever had. Amazing. Yeah, so you got to live up to Jill here because uh, she set the... Okay, well, wait a second. There were other people involved in that podcast. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about uh, Nightmare Alley. It's a super impressive film. I had a lot of fun watching it. The way the film's kind of structured is it's divided into two parts. There's a first part of the film that takes place in a carnival. And uh, it's where our main character kind of, as Teresa mentioned in the intro, learns how to do the grift. But it's a kind of more gritty, uh, mechanical kind of sounding world that he's in. And then in the second half of the film, he goes to the big city and it's a very sleek and kind of contained sound to the film. Uh, Maybe we can start at the beginning and take apart the first half of the film. A lot of it takes place inside these big carnival tents. And they kind of have a presence throughout the film, the sound of the tents flapping. How did you come to include those sounds? And what was your thought process behind that? Maybe, Nathan, you want to grab that? Yeah, sure. Um, Yeah, the the movie definitely does take place in two different halves. And so, you know, we did find ourselves trying to set a tone twice for this movie. And in the first half of the movie, all that grit, I associate that as being part of how in sort of poverty, things are a bit looser. There's a bit more play in reality and they don't fit quite so tightly together. The tents specifically, I I remember early on when I was working, just putting scenes together for the Avid, Cam McLaughlin, the picture editor, he sent me this file and he said, man, you got to listen to this. And I listened to it. They had recorded the tents that they were shooting in and they sounded amazing. Like they, they sounded musical. You could hear it sounded like, you know, almost like uh, masts pinging at a, at a harbor. You know what I mean? Just like a lot of um, all the guy lines and things like this, as well as the this big heavy canvas tent inflating with air and then deflating in the wind. It had so much life and it wasn't even a, a character. And so we had to get in there and record. And so um, actually Dishan Naidu, who was uh, one of the sound effects editors on the show, came with me to set and we recorded the tents um, 
part of it was just like luck of the wind. And then other parts, we would grab sections of that canvas and start manipulating it or grab a pole and start shifting it around to get as much uh, life out of the tents as we possibly could to sort of perform them a little bit. Yeah, and while we were there, we picked up a whole bunch of other recordings of, of things like, you know, the, the carousel, the Ferris wheel, the bumper cars, and all these other things that had a lot of kind of rickety, carny, loose-fitting parts to them that all added this level of disconnected detail. Things just felt like they were shooting from the hip a little bit more. And it, that all kind of goes back to the this philosophy where, you know, things that are less expensive or worn down are loose and soft and, and kind of broken. Once things become more expensive, they fit together more tightly. They're more concise. As you mentioned in the first half of the movie, things feel more mechanical and gritty. I think that's that looseness, that play within components. Then when we get to the city, things get a bit more concise. What comes along with that, obviously, technically speaking, is the challenge to dialogue. Was part of the reason for capturing some of those sounds related to how that was interacting with the production dialogue? In theory, part of it. I would defer to Jill on this one, but I know... Uh, one of the other visits I had, I was given some access to go to set and sit with Greg, the location recordist. And I remember sitting there and hearing a lot of generators and a lot of fog machine and stuff like that. I was just there to record the extras between takes because I wanted some uh, authentic sounding crowds. We started recording things that would get laid up to kind of fill some of those holes and, and lift some of the, the curses that Greg was fighting against. But, you know, Jill's kind of a magician who can make everything sound like it was recorded in a clean, quiet environment. So I'll, uh, I'll toss it over to her and let her speak to whether or not we were successful in helping out. Yeah, definitely successful. Um, but I mean, Greg, Greg dealt with, as you said, a lot of challenges and, and he was great in trying to record wild tracks and as much as much um, extra as possible, which came in handy because it wasn't so much as, as making everything sound clean as it was making everything sound consistent because every take, you know, had either a generator or not or a wind machine or not, or sometimes it was raining really hard and then it wasn't. So it was more about that consistency. And I think anything that um, Nathan and Dash recorded was supplemented on their end, probably in cutting it against production effects and that sort of thing and filling in those holes rather than anything they recorded sending in in the dialogue direction and having having us fill in the holes um, on the dialogue side of things, um, but there was definitely a lot of a lot of material to work with, which made which made the piecing of, together of the scenes a lot easier. Was the tent ruffling and moving present in the production dialogue track? The tent rustling, not so much. Anything that it was was. It, more of the action scenes where there, you know, the tents going up or down, and there wasn't a whole lot of dialogue that wasn't um, supplemented by ADR efforts or breaths and, and call outs and that sort of thing. So that wasn't too much of a, of an issue for me. It was more the um, exterior scenes in the snow were a bit of an issue in terms of uh, machines, which actually cleaned up really, really well from from my standpoint. But um, there was some issue with lav mics and wind in those scenes. There was an issue with um, Lilith Lav in a couple of scenes that we had to deal with. But, you know, for the most part, anything that we, the noise on set was kind of roped into the ambience for that scene and it worked in a way that was supplemental instead of um, detrimental, which was good. Which actually made kind of a cool proposition that we were given so much access to set and we could build a bit of a library out of the same materials that were sort of pinging against each other, flapping away in the wind behind any production dialogue because I think, you know, from from the effects and design side of things, at least, we felt like we were painting like from the same palette as the, the dialogue side. So I was jealous. I didn't I didn't go to that set. <laughs> I should have should have gone on your, your coattails because that's completely up my alley, so to speak. <laughs> I would have loved it's that. It's not it's not up mine. I felt like <laughs> a, I felt like a fish out of water on set. Oh yeah? Why is that? I don't often go to set. I spend so much time, you know, locked in a dark room being left to my own toys and, and crazy thought patterns that I can uh, <laughs> can subtract myself from that world. When I go, it's pretty exciting, but um, it's hard to know when you have that many moving parts and that, that much chaos happening. I should say organized chaos because it's, it is extremely organized. Um, as a strictly post person, it's foreign. So you don't know if you're stepping on toes. You don't know if you're in the way. I was constantly mindful, and anytime I uh, wanted to shift my position, I had to look over and gre at Greg and, 
and get his cue to make sure that I wasn't about to blow something up on somebody. Can you talk a little bit about how you negotiate when you're on set? What can I touch? What can I touch? Like, who are you talking to? How does that stuff get vetted? Yeah, everyone was extremely welcoming. I, I mean, like it was, it, you know, any any sort of uh, worries I had about getting in the way or, 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 or like, you know, tangling things up uh, for anyone else were quickly put at ease. I basically set up my, I just wanted to hide a bunch of radio mics around set to record crowds while I was there. So it was a pretty limited thing while I was on the active set. Most of the other times I went to set, they weren't shooting. So they they were like maybe moving some like some equipment around but there were quiet moments where we were, we could record tents and things like that when i was there during the active shoot honestly really my anchor point was greg once i had my radio frequencies set up they conflicted with a few other radio frequencies so the guys just came in and they told me like i'm getting some noise can you guys sort out whether this channel is free or not and i would just have to get off of that channel but once we were set up it was largely just a case of i kind of sat there did my thing Every now and then I'd run around to change batteries. I would make sure that the mics were placed, you know, if, if the mic wasn't really getting anything, I could move it somewhere else to get a, a, a better track. But basically before I did any of that, it was just look over at Greg. Greg would give me the nod. I'd hightail it out there, navigate a bunch of extras who are wearing face masks between, between uh, takes and deal with the mics. And, you know, at one point, you know, he just said, we've got talent coming here to get mic'd up so you gotta bounce so I, I i got out of the way you know but largely yeah he, he was there to sort of make sure i didn't uh, i didn't step on any toes or get in anyone's way so speaking of there being lots of people around that's one of the other hallmarks of the first half of the film is that the carnival's full of people so i'm imagining between those recordings that you made on set there was also a lot of ADR recorded and loop group. Uh, how do you go about finding loop group that can get the right accents for this, I guess, Southern United States? Is it Kentucky or something like that? I'm not sure where it, the first half takes place. The back half is in Buffalo. And also back in time, going back to those accents uh, from the 40s. How do you spot find those people? That comes through loop group casters. So um, Dan Fink and Bruce Winant based in New York, have scoped out talent for some shows I've been on for probably the past 10 or 12 years. I've known those guys. And I can say to them, hey, you know, we need this many people and we need them all from Kentucky or from Louisiana and we need all these people from Buffalo and we need them in like an hour, um, they will find them and they will do it exquisitely and they'll give me the whole rundown of, of the backstory of where these these actors grew up and how cool they are in doing, you know, 40s voices. And I mean, it was just, it was just, incredible. I mean, I, that's the least of my, of my issues is, is casting. Once you get all that material, it's your problem, right? Yeah. Although in this case it wasn't, it was, um, it was a blessing again, uh, because we had kind of limited time, limited budget. So we had ended up having, um, 12 people. So we recorded seven people in studio, five people remotely, but all at the same time, Bobby Johansson out of, um, Harbor Post in New York recorded it. And he also knew the actors pretty well, and we situated the carnival people mostly in the studio because of the call-out scenario and being able to control the variables in the studio more. And because of COVID, um, we also had some couples involved, so, you know, actors that live together that could be together in the studio. So we maximized it that way. I mean, it was just this whole grand scheme of things that, that worked together really well. And Bobby would just know inherently who to record and what feed to record on. So he was he was recording clean feed from the remote actors and the studio at the same time on separate channels, although they were communicating with each other. So I had this incredible, I mean, yes, it was a lot of work, but the, the ability to separate easier. Like, I mean, normally you have, you know, four to 10 to 12 people in a studio. And, you know, if everybody's talking at once, everybody's talking at once. And in this case, you know, we would have a couple in one room studio wise, because I think we had three different studios, maybe at Harbor. And all of those could be separated. So if we didn't, if we wanted to thin it out, it was just a matter of you know, like muting one channel, or you could have one couple talking to someone that wasn't originally talking to them. I mean, it was incredible. It was it was the best session I've ever recorded. And I've been doing this, you know, uh, well, I didn't record it, I would have liked to take credit for that. But, um, you know, in the 25, 26 years, I've been doing this, that was the most incredible experience. And it, you know, it was so essential to to being a, a character on its own in this film that it was, uh, it was amazing. That's so interesting to hear somebody 
finally talk about an upside to COVID <laughs> in terms of the, the, the workflows that people have had to kind of twist themselves into knots to figure out um, in the last two, two years. So that's really interesting. It's a weird flip. Like COVID definitely helped split the movie into two very different movies, give two very different vibes between the first and back half of the movie. But it's also kind of ironic that the section of the movie that had a flood of extras and a flood of of additional human beings who had to inhabit the same space was shot during the pandemic. Well, Buffalo, which is largely sort of like small scenes with few actors on screen, was shot prior to the pandemic. <laughs> oh, so it was shot in reverse order? <laughs> yeah, totally, yeah. The back half was shot before the first half. Yeah, we, we started receiving uh, scenes for the back half of the movie uh, back in, yeah, 2019 is when we started working on things like the Copacabana and, you know... I'm actually curious because Jill, I mean, now we would have been working together on those scenes. I remember uh, you breathing a lot of life into the Copa crowds in 2019. And I think that we were getting a lot of that sort of like period authentic voice work done then, were we not? Yeah, here and there. I mean, we did some auditions for the Barkers and some of the specific call outs at that time. So we recorded those and then at that time for you, I had pulled from previous groups that I had recorded that kind of fit the bill until we could get the actors in um, to replace that. How long was your hiatus? I know they stopped shooting for six months, but Nathan, you had you had a little more involvement. You didn't have a full like six months. It wasn't a full six months off. So once once the lockdowns happened, it was pretty quick switching over to the sort of reviewing via Evercast process that that got ironed out really quickly in the beginning. And, and it was important to Guillermo to keep a handful of us going because we had started so much in the the back half of the movie, the Buffalo side of the movie. And he just got, I think he just wanted to like cross T's and dot I's and make sure that those concepts were, were wrapped up and, and sort of packaged together before we signed off. But we were all able to do that uh, from isolation from our own, our own home studios and stuff like that. So it's a bit more of a blurry line in terms of the length of the hiatus uh, for me, because I also wound up coming back on a little bit early once we did get started up because I was going to set to record stuff. And, you know, I kind of picked up a little a little ahead of time there. As far as a rough answer is concerned, I'd say probably about six months, give or take. The first, like, maybe eight to ten minutes of the film, our main character doesn't say a single word. I think the first time he talks is once he goes into the funhouse looking for the geek. Did you approach the soundtrack in any different way, given that we kind of had a mute main character up until that point? The stuff that takes place in the in the early set, the early like the opening of the movie, you know, it was meant to be as sort of in your face and visceral as possible. You know, him dragging a body across the floor, and you know, that's pretty. That's some pretty potent imagery, and so you know, we're really just there to complement that to make sure that you know we get that we we really hammer that point across. Although there is one thing that I kind of really dig about what sound helps to accomplish in that early scene, which is that he drags his father into a hole in the floor and buries him and burns the place down and walks away through a cornfield in the summertime. All the while, you've got like summer backgrounds and summer ambiences. But in all of the dream sequences where he, to me, fantasizes about killing his father, he kills him with the cold of a, of a, a winter blizzard. And so to me, that helps to sort of reinforce uh, Pete's black rainbow in how Stan wants to kill his father, but didn't necessarily kill his father. And I think sound, like just presenting, being so forward with the sort of summertime ambiences and cicadas and, you know, grasshoppers and things like that, I, I thought was, uh, it was a cool opportunity to sort of give, give a lot of seasonal life to those early scenes. It feels like the movie is structured kind of around seasons, right? There's like definite, there's a lot of sort of weather related stuff going on in terms of the sort of chapters of the film. So I had not twigged to what you're talking about. So that's really interesting. I'm sure it was acting subconsciously. That's an interesting point. One of the main characters in the film, Rooney Mara, uh, in the first half of the film, her act in the carnival is that she conducts electricity through her body. And electricity is one of those things that uh, 
due to Hanna-Barbera cartoons and stuff like that. We all have a very ingrained version of what uh, electrical sparking should be. But uh, the way you get, you approached it is a little bit different and I found to be really cool. Do you want to kind of go into how you came up with the sound of the electricity? Yeah, I think that's probably just one of those av- aversions to the the Hanna-Barbera of it all. You know, when you have someone like Guillermo and with those discriminating tastes and, you know, you, you get he makes sure that we have the runway necessary to play around and make sure that each sound we choose is kind of unique. I wanted to make sure that it sounded uh, dangerous because it had to, it had to startle the audience, but you know, dangerous without being that sort of classic zip zap electronic, you know, jolt sound and, and, and and fizzle really just hunting out interesting sounds and and trying to find cool elements, you know what I mean? Things that could, uh, that could really, uh, you know, advance the excitement of a scene more so actually, because like the first one, the first one of the Electra acts that, uh, that I got to, you know, dig into was the second one that we see on screen where the, the sheriff comes to the carnival and uh, and Major pulls the switch, and we, we get to see the big show, the big show that Stan orchestrates. And uh, that one, I yeah, I just I wanted it to build and build and build and build and get more exciting. And you know, I, I associate that with an ascending pitch. And so the the standout element in there was actually a gibbon, like the monkey, how they just kind of go like ooh, ooh, you know. And I just took one of those and I kept time compression expanding it and then time compression expanding it, and I just kept expanding it and letting it degrade in quality until it sounded like sort of a almost digital electronic, yeah, like a a, a sparks element. Yeah, and I just stretched that out until we had this ascending pitch underneath all the the snapping, crackly magic. (laughs) One of my favorite moments in the film is that scene where uh, our main character's explaining the new setup that he's built for Rooney Mara's character. And uh, someone asks what the spinning wheel in the back is and just very quietly offhandedly, that is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> this is my favorite line in the film. That's bullshit. Ignore that. <laughs> well, and, and to tie the bullshit into later in the movie, because there's a ton of symmetry in this movie, that spinning wheel, that bullshit, since they're going tick, 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 tick. And it's a kind of uh, weirdly syncopated rhythm so it's identifiable in its rhythm or lack thereof, enough so that we take that sound and later on when Stan is being interrogated with the polygraph machine, we shrink it down and stuff it inside the polygraph machine because to Stan in that scene, it's the polygraph machine that's bullshit. I was wondering, I was like, there's something between, I mean, obviously the whole electrical aspect of those two set pieces, they're like, there's a visual symmetry and all that stuff that's really cool to hear that you're playing with those uh, sound effects as well to tie those things together. Yeah, well, I mean, and that's a lot of Guillermo's influence. He loves he loves symmetry. He loves the callbacks. He likes to to use something in the beginning that we use again in the end. That was actually one of the early notes. Um, Jill, I, I'm sure you remember this. He wanted us to use the same elements, not just sound effects, but also ADR and dialogue elements in the train yard chase at the end that we used in the geek chase in the beginning to draw a parallel between the geek and Stan. Mm. It's, it's kind of interesting because based on the title of the film, if you're not aware of the original book, it sounds like it's going to be a horror film, Nightmare Alley. And it's not a horror film at all, but you kind of almost play off that because that first time we go into the uh, fun house, it has a very kind of classic horror setup with the giant uh, teeth opening up for the tra- that the track goes through. Uh, how did you approach that scene? Were you thinking about the kind of horror films during that or no? Not really. That's actually one that we actually get to build more than once. <laughs> that's that's one of those that we're like we 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 tried it a few different ways. We tried it like uh, my my first take on it was like with all of the like all of the funhouse gadgets and uh, a carnival style funhouse. Um, but that later got paired back. Like the funhouse is not running. He's just walking through an empty funhouse that is off. Uh, funhouse Jack just basically flips a switch to get out of the door. Um, but yeah, we went from we, like we've had we we tried that with a full fleshed out design treatment, and we parsed it all the way back to almost nothing, and I think it landed in a nice middle ground. Um, but yeah, as far as as far as the nightmare elements, um, the bigger standout elements would have been the breathing tent. It was very important to keep the tent breathing, 
And I remember Guillermo saying he wanted that devil face that opens up that Stan walks through to be shocking. It was. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah. Like it, it really feels like a punch in the teeth. But then beyond that, it just kind of goes back to that opportunity that we had to go finding interesting, cool, fun, little ear candy sounds to sprinkle in here and there. Things that you're not necessarily expecting to hear. Like when he first walks through that devil's face, you can hear that there's like one of those velvet rope set up. So they're supposed to guide the carnival goers through the fun house and you see velvet rope set up. Well, kind of front and center, you see one of those brass poles that, that you attach the velvet rope to and it's dripping in there. So I found this track of like um, rain hitting bells, like musical bells. And so we were able to place that there and Brad was able to sort of follow it through the room a little bit, just as this nice little piece of musical texture for the space. And it was just little things like that that we could tuck in here and there and, and, and find find chances to, to play around. Cool. And, Considering Guillermo del Toro's previous films, like this is what, maybe the first one that doesn't have a supernatural aspect to it specifically. So you guys still manage to find those kind of like edgy, like on the edge of reality moments. To me, that's what puts it in the nice half of like a genre category of noir or something like it. It still has that kind of almost theatrical aspect to it because of these sort of special stuff that you're putting in to kind of make it sort of hyper real or, or not quite real or something. Definitely fantastical, which is kind of our answer to the call of the imagery that Guillermo and Dan Lauston, you know, pull in through the camera. There's some beautiful images and, and there's always so much depth and richness to what shows up on the on the monitor. So it's on us to do our best to to complement that with sound. We've talked a bit about the first half of the movie. Let's uh, go into the second half of the movie where we enter the city life and uh, everything gets more uh, sleek, as I mentioned earlier, but it also becomes more contained. The uh, first half of the movie feels wide open in a way, even though a lot of it's inside tents, where the second half of the movie takes place inside rooms for the most part. When people are going in and out of the rooms, the sound from outside the room almost always kind of disappears. 100% part of the plan from day one. I would say that was one of the first notes that we got from Guillermo, which is that, um, I mean, the, the sort of pared down way to phrase this is with the poverty of the carnival comes freedom, that open air feel where, you know, there's, you don't have much, but you have freedom. But once you get to the city, you've got more wealth but less freedom, a lot more restrictive. You're more isolated. And he wanted every room to feel like it was a sort of an airless tomb that was completely separated from the outside world to sort of isolate our characters as much as possible, which all just sort of feeds that sort of malignancy of greed, right? Because he's really chasing, he's, Stan is chasing his greed and, you know, be careful what you wish for. He gets what he was after, but along with it comes very little wiggle room in his life. He he finds himself, you know, living by the terms of of these, you know, wealthy, you know, magnates like uh, Grindel and and Lilith, and it just becomes more su more and more suffocating to him. Uh, so, Jill, when you are working in the second half of the film, you've got a whole different problem with your uh, loop group. Now you're no longer in Kentucky. Now you're in Buffalo. Instead of people yelling and shouting at the carnival, having a great time, it's a much more uh, restrained uh, performances, I would think. How did you go about uh, building those worlds? Colors are a big thing with Guillermo. He likes hearing, you know, he likes everything so specific and nuanced and what speaker it's going to play through and what level it's going to be at and raising things by a DB. So the big thing was, was trying to situate the call outs and getting everything covered because, he, you know, he wanted a someone selling papers and, you know, specific references to, you know, shoe shining and, and that whole thing. So it was it was fun to, to play with those and, and just uh, what piqued his interest or what he what he loved to hear and where he wanted to hear it. Like, he'd be like, I love that call it. Let's move it 10 frames earlier. And bam, it would just make the, the scene all that more intentional and motivate the scene more. So it was it was really interesting. I mean, I had a blast putting those layers together of the group and then hearing it with, you know, the sound design and how it was moving through the room was quite amazing to behold. It was it was a really fun end product to listen to. You'll have that one specific call out that we all hear on the stage. It gets soloed. We all know it's there. It's definitely there. And then it goes in and it sort of melts into the fabric of this world that Guillermo's intent on building. 
it's just incredible how like he'll he he will tune into that too for in the mix it's placement frame accurate placement left and right playing with each poke out's line playback level and it just builds this this sort of rich tapestry that in some cases you know that thing will poke out enough that you can distinguish one line from the rest of the wash where in other cases it just it just blends in so perfectly and makes this this world like it it really does build a world because he's that's that's his thing man that's his jam he finds a way to to place things around the room to to really put you there and make you feel like you're in the same space he's so collaborative that you know you can put your you know nathan put his own uh design elements in there i could put a call out or whatever in there and it may have been something that guillermo didn't specifically ask for but if he hears it he'll run with it and and you know incorporate it in a way that supplements what he wants for the scene or for that specific moment. So it's, it's really cool to work with him that way. Jill, earlier you mentioned something uh, about Kate Blanchett's microphone. Uh, I didn't want to go down that rabbit hole while we were still talking about the first half of the movie, but now that we're into the second half of the movie, uh, you mentioned there was something wrong with one of her labs. Can you kind of dig into that and how you cleaned it up? I just want to give a shout out to Greg Chapman because you couldn't pay me enough to be uh, a production mixer. There's no way. And I, I give kudos because... I wouldn't be able to deal with it. I would. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how Greg did it on this movie, but the tracks I had to work with were incredible. So I have to thank him for that. But I think there was just an issue with a couple of her takes where I don't know. I don't know if it was something slipped or you know. I have no idea what the issue was, but it was a very. Um, her laugh ended up sounding a bit thin, in a way that I haven't actually heard. I haven't had to work with quality in this particular respect before. So it's just a matter of trying different things, trying to, to denoise or trying to EQ it in a way so that it, it sounded a little more a little more usable in conjunction with the boom. So there was a lot more work trying to make the boom sound more full or whatever to kind of take up the slack for when you would normally have the boom and the laugh aligned, phased, and, and playing together. So we lost some of that element. So it was um, either working with the boom to accommodate that difference or making the lab in those specific spots uh, be usable enough to play with the boom in a way that you didn't notice the quality difference. But I'm, I'm a big proponent of um, isotope. I, I like things to sound as organic as possible. I'm not a fan of overprocessing at all. I, I really dislike it. You know, I just, I spend a lot of time trying to enhance the audio quality without sacrificing the, the quality of the voice. Yeah. I've had I've had a few conversations with Tim when we see movies, and I'm I'm definitely more dialogue focused. Uh, he's obviously more sound design focused, and so we have conversations where I like I noticed this. Oh, I didn't notice that. I noticed this. Well, I didn't notice that. I was paying attention to what was happening with the dialogue there. And my feeling about films in the last couple of years is that dialogue is getting really scrubbed, and I don't know if that's just my impression. I don't know if you have any opinions on like trends in dialogue denoising and how things are sounding these days uh, in general or what you're being asked to do in terms of cleaning up stuff. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what, I don't know if it's, you know, that article that came out recently on intelligible sound and, and whatever dialogue. And I found that very interesting because I agree with it a thousand percent. But again, that's a, that's a separate conversation. The majority of the tracks that I work with are not anywhere near the quality that they used to be like, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. Um, I find a lot of my time is spent surgically working with every single region because it's it's not consistent. It's like literally there's, you know, you know, crickets on one and then they disappear. Every single shot is completely different sounding than the previous one, even though they're in the same scene. So I find a lot of my work now is surgical and not a lot of flow to it until you get to the end product and then I can do a final pass on it and, and be a little more creative with with finding alts or making things sound a little a little smoother than I'd like because there's so there's only so much time to work with and you have to get it sounding the, for something that's usable because there aren't budgets or the actors aren't available to bring actors in to do ADR and, and quite honestly there are some TV episodes, some scenes of films where you could literally like script the entire thing for ADR just by virtue of, of the quality of those tracks and it's it's unfortunate and I don't know where where the issue lies because there are amazing production mixers out there, and I, I don't think that they're necessarily given the the time or the um, respect for the craft that they're 
possibly could be. Yeah, and I think that the thrust of that article that you're referencing was that if the directors and, and the camera crews and such were giving enough respect or, or listening enough to what the production sound crews are asking for, that we could make a lot of progress with not a lot of changes. It's just a question of having that dialogue open and giving the production team essentially a little more leeway in, in being able to implement what their suggestions are in terms of improving the location sound. Read the article. It puts it in much better terms than I just rambled on about. <laughs> we'll definitely put a link to the article uh, on the episode page for this one. Anyway, sorry, tangent. <laughs> it's all good. That was interesting. Thanks. Throughout the course of the film, there's kind of a theme that our main character, played by Bradley Cooper, doesn't drink. And slowly, our Kate Blanchett character lures him over to the other side, and he does start drinking. But the actual crystal glassware is also kind of luring him in a weird way. There's like a, the, the glass is singing to him, almost like the ring in Lord of the Rings or something like that. How did you come up with the idea to do that? And how did you actually come up with those sounds, Nathan? <laughs> throw throw him the chicken hill geek <laughs> yeah the the glassware that i mean an early note from from guillermo he wanted it to sound like real crystal much like so much of the back half of the movie was all about the the status symbols of of what we're seeing in the props that are being used from you know lilith stilettos like she she was actually wearing kind of chunky heels but he wanted her stilettos to sound like daggers on a on a marble floor he wanted he just wanted things to sound very expensive like that royston touch tip lighter that she lights his cigarette with and things like that things needed to be very concise and very uh very expensive sounding and the glasses were for Lilith, one of those statement pieces, that was one of the status symbols for her was to have this high-end crystal glassware. We tried a few cracks at that one to get it right. But yeah, it was pretty important to Guillermo that we, we got something that sounded like crystal and not glass. And in the end, it wound up being sort of a tag team effort between the the Foley crew up at uh, Footsteps. That's Andy Malcolm and Goro Koyama. They got some beautiful sounding crystal tumblers and things. And that's a lot of the handling sounds when they when they first interact with them is the Foley being played up. But then thankfully, because of the sort of telescoping schedule on this movie, we were able to work pretty closely with them. Like they would send us their full treatment on the on the reels and I could listen to it and sweeten it to taste and so a lot of that was the bass element would be fully followed up by a little bit of love from us on the on the sound effects side and and I think the sound you're talking about that singing tone is just me sitting there with a recorder some water and a wine glass and rimming the the top of the wine glass and tilting it to get pitch changes and and follow around the movements that the various crystal wear pieces uh, go through on screen. Um, the sort of collaborative end result there wound up being uh, pretty musical, which is exactly what we were aiming for. That's so it's like a little perfect moment where you're just like, man, they they nailed that. That is like it sounds real. Like it's that yeah that sound that is so hard to capture, right? Because it's such a small and delicate sound, <laughs> um, but it's totally clear. And then it's got it sort of like evolves into this kind of like kind of magical extra thing going on. It's just so perfect. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I think that's one of those byproducts of being given the the leeway to to play around to be given the space to to work on these things both by you know Guillermo's insistence that we that we take time and have fun and and dig in and play but also by the 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 fact that you know this pandemic gave a lot of people a lot of free time to to really scratch their head and and dig in and figure out ways that they can make the mundane sound fantastical. <laughs> and you just happen to have wine glasses lying around. I mean, I think everybody <laughs> did during the pandemic. <laughs> um, for maybe a last question to wrap up, Guillermo del Toro is kind of making himself known as a, a, a major presence in the world of film with his last many films. What did you learn from working with him on this film? Did he pass on any new ways of thinking about things that you will take on to new projects? For me personally, I think it's more of a um, sort of calcification of a, a theory that most sound designers have and develop over time, which is that nothing is precious. You know, sometimes a great sound isn't the right sound. And so 
this is one of those movies where we basically developed great sound from top to tail from the top of the movie to the bottom it was wallpapered and then when we got to the mix stage it was just a matter of you know playing the winning hands if you learn anything from working with Guillermo it's that nothing is precious not even his own ideas I've watched him take brilliant ideas of his own that came together and sounded beautiful and just hit the cutting room floor because they were not serving the purpose you know ego doesn't get in the way it's just straight up sometimes a great sound isn't the right sound nothing is precious Jill that was summed up perfectly I mean Guillermo's always moving creatively at like a thousand miles an hour and it's it's amazing to witness and it's amazing, like I said before, to collaborate with. And what Nathan said is, is just bang on. And it's, it's, I think it's the constantly full of ideas, trying things and trying different things and trying so many different things to try and get that one little moment, that one tiny little piece of, of story that may have been like lacking or just not there enough to push through. And it, it's, it's pretty amazing to witness, I gotta say. And it's, it's intense, but it's, it's so creative. He's he's probably the most creative being I think I've I've worked with, to be honest. And it's in all these weird, wonderful ways that you'd expect. I had to write something talking about you know working with Guillermo. I described it as a metaphorical tornado, a train, a creative train riding <laughs> through a metaphorical tornado. Yeah, and then the other side, you deal with the aftermath, and uh, and the aftermath just happens to be art. <laughs> There's this collaboration, this village that takes all these pieces of destruction and puts them together and makes it something more beautiful. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, this was a really fun talk, and I'm glad that uh, we got to talk about this film because I think it's a really fun film. I don't know that it's a fun film, but it's a super enjoyable film. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Um, so yeah, thanks for joining us, and we'll uh, hopefully have you on again soon. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Bye bye. Film Figures is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Morrow. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tonebenders, and join Tonebenders Podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or B and H, or leave us a tip. Just go to ToneBendersPodcast.com and click the support button. Thanks for listening. Are you looking for more audio-related podcasts to listen to? ToneBenders is part of the Audio Podcast Alliance, featuring a hand-picked selection of the very best podcasts about sound. Be sure to hear the latest episodes from our friends in the community at audiopodcast.org. 